Uh, thank you for putting up with the pre-show music. Uh, this, uh, this is living proof that I have to have a playlist to keep up with my eight-year-old son, Jack, uh, because otherwise, yeah, let's hear the, aww. Because otherwise, you know, it's like, I gotta be the hip dad. So uh, thank you for being here. I really appreciate this. Uh, yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we still have seats in the front row and I don't call on anybody in the front row. So um, earlier, some people talked about their love or likeness for two stars. So, you know, if you want to begin to take out your evaluation forms now, anybody who is a fan of Adam Levine or Derek Huff, this is what's called a nudge. Just take it out right now. I want you to feel the love. And this is a participatory talk. So. If you want to take it out, uh, let me explain how this works, OK? You put my name at the top. You just, it's very simple. You just circle all fives. You put, great fun, please bring him back. That's all you have to do. So if you want to do it now, later, it's just in the far right column, OK? Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's get started. Uh, can anybody tell me what this wonderful woman eating chocolates has in common with this man who's obviously a little stressed out and this woman who's doing shoe shopping. What do they have in common? There are no wrong answers here. There's no grading, no discussion boards, no papers. Using his money. Uh, they might be using his money. <laughs> Behavior. Behavior, yes. Making choices, yes, they are making choices. And that's what we're talking about today, because we are talking about the whole concept of making choices and the tyranny of making choices. So whether it's shoe shopping or any other kind of choice, when we have too many choices, what can happen? Analysis paralysis. So this goes with a book called Nudge, which was written in 2008. And I'm going to try to give it a 2014 spin, which includes online. And it was written by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. So why is this important? Well, it's important because we make so many choices in life. We make choices about who do we date? What school do we go to? Who do we marry? Having a child and what to buy. So all of these choices eventually you know, affect all of us in life and as marketers. Here's a staggering statistic I just pulled up uh, this morning. Shopping cart abandonment online is a major challenge for online businesses. In 2013, the average rate when people did not complete the shopping cart, look at this, 75%. So there's a real issue here about what's stopping people from completing a purchase. So, Let's get to nudge. What's the definition of nudge? Nudge is to slightly push somebody a little bit or gently nudge them to get them to pay attention, to prod them. But it's not all about, hi, will you buy this car right now, please? You'd look so good in that car and we can make the payments $10 a week for the rest of your life and your children's lives. It's not about that. It's about something less than that. So in the book, the authors define nudge as altering people's behavior in a predictable way without significantly changing everything else around them, the economic incentives. Let's put that into English. Nudges are about designing choices that make it simple for people. And that's what I want to talk to you today about and giving you many different examples, both in store and online. So we're talking about the marketing of the nudge. We're really not doing National Geographic in Africa today. Um, nudging is about choices. This is about how people make choices. It is about limiting choice. Because limiting choice can actually be a positive for all of you and for the customers that we're trying to market to. And it also assumes, I think, something that we all know, we have limited time. So it gets into also how we send out messages. It gets into what names we pick. And you'll see this when I do the online section. It changes how we motivate consumers. 
and how to nudge people into a commitment. So here's nudge in a consumer setting. We have cheese for sale here at $4, $7, $3, and $10. Raise your hand if you want the $4 cheese. Raise your hand if you want the $7 cheese. Everybody gets to participate here, so let's start over. Raise your hand if you want. There's no wrong answer. If you want the $4 cheese, raise your hand. You'll get the Pepper Jack people, you will get your chance. <laughs> Calm down. We'll get to you. Who, raise your hand if you want the $4 cheese. Raise your hand high if you want the $7 cheese. Raise your hand if you want the $3 cheese. A lot of people. Raise your hand if you want the $10 cheese. OK, thank you. We'll go on to a different example. No. <laughs> Studies actually show that most people will tend to choose the second most expensive item on the list. Which means that if you were pricing, and you'll see how we do this online and both in store. If you were pricing items and determining what price to set your price point at, more often than not, whatever the second most expensive item is, is what most consumers will choose. So if you start, this can relate to nonprofit donations too. So if you go two, six, eight, nine, they'll go for eight. If you go four, six, eight, ten, more often they'll go for the eight. You see how it works? We'll get to some other examples. So how you frame prices can make a difference, and this is based on research. So let's do framing and gym memberships. Do you want to spend, hi, I'm here to get you into a gym. I certainly need one. <laughs> do you want to spend $600 a year or $12 a week? What? You chose $12 a week, and why? Because that's only a little more than you spend on lunch. That's right. But you know what $12 times 52 is? About $600, yeah. But it's just a little nudge. It's so much easier to convince you to, without feedback, make that buy, right? So it's how we frame the prices. Uh, here's an example of how to motivate people through a nudge. In one famous set of studies, researchers found, rather unsurprisingly, that very few people would be willing to erect an unsightly wooden board on their front lawn to support a drive safely campaign in their neighborhood. However, in a similar neighborhood close by, four times as many homeowners indicated that they would be willing to erect this unsightly billboard. Why? Because 10 days previously, they had agreed to place a small postcard in the front window of their home that signaled their support for a drive safely campaign. That small card was the initial commitment that led to a 400% increase in a much bigger but still consistent change. So what do we learn from this? People will move forward if you ask for a small commitment first. As we relate this to politics, if you go around and say, hi, would you put a political sign in your lawn? They might say, no. But scientific research has shown that if you go in and you ask for something small, and then you come back, more often than not, you get the larger ask that you originally wanted. So there are four types of nudges that the authors talk about, and I'll cover this today. There are mindful nudges, which guide people to a more controlled state. And the book was written originally uh, in some ways to help people adopt a more healthy lifestyle. So that's why it refers to healthy eating, stop smoking, exercising. So these can be very positive nudges. There are, I don't know why they call this mindless nudges, because every nudge you know, really does affect us in some way. But it uses emotion or framing, which I'm trying to talk a lot about today. Um, there are encouraging nudges that facilitate you know, the decisions that we're going to make in terms of a particular behavior. And the final one can be discouraging nudges that move us away from a negative or undesirable type of behavior. 
we'll see some examples. So these are the four types. So you can also nudge. How many people here have younger children that you have allegedly raised? <laughs> okay, you'll appreciate this. This comes from the book Drive, and it has to do with what motivates us. It's really in some ways about leadership and motivating teams, but it also relates to nudge when you ask the right questions. People want a choice, they want autonomy, they want to be able to uh, have engagement, and they also want non-controlling language. So here's an example that relates to parenting and a nudge. So let me give you a, a hypothetical. Suppose that you're a parent and you have a daughter, say a teenage daughter, whose room is an absolute mess. It just looks like a bomb went off in there, and you want your daughter to clean your room. You're trying to sell her on the idea of cleaning her room. What do you do? Well, you could try to bribe her, and that might work in the short term. You could try to threaten her, that might work in the short term. You can try to exhort her, you can try to you know, tell her about the meaning of clean rooms. Um, but um, there's actually a technique from actually the counseling literature, um, really crystallized by a fellow named Mike Pantalon of Yale University, uh, called motivational interviewing. And what you can do more effectively is ask two irrational questions. So let's say that you have a daughter named Maria, and Maria has a messy room, and you want Maria to clean her room. The two questions you could ask Maria are this. Maria, on a scale of 1 to 10, one meaning I'm not ready at all, 10 meaning I'm ready to do it right now. How ready are you, Maria, to clean your room? Now, Maria's room is a pigsty, so she's not going to give a very happy, she's not going to give you a 10 or a 9 or even a 5. Maybe she'll give you a 2. Okay? So she says, Dad, I'm a 2. Well, here's where the second question comes in, and it's a really interesting counterintuitive question. You say to Maria, okay, Maria, you're a 2. Why didn't you pick a lower number. Now, our instinct as parents is to say, as a parent of three kids, I have this instinct very strongly. If my kid were to say to me, I'm a two, I would say, what? Why are you a two? You should be a nine. But you say, why didn't you pick a lower number, Maria? So here's what happens. Maria has to explain why she isn't a one. Okay? And so she says, well, you know, I am 15, and I probably should get my act together. You know, if I had my room cleaner, I'd be able to get to school on time faster and maybe see my friends a little bit more. You know, you and mom never know where anything is anyway, so I'm kind of wasting my time asking you to help me. What happened? With that second question, why didn't you pick a lower number, Maria begins articulating her own reasons for doing something. And this is really axiomatic in sales and persuasion. When people have their own reasons for doing something, not yours, their own reasons for doing something, they believe those reasons more deeply and adhere to the behavior more strongly. Does that make sense? So science shows that we are also more likely to reciprocate when somebody does something nice for us. Has anybody here worked in food services? Okay, you may have also seen this video, but this relates to tipping. One of the best demonstrations of the principle of reciprocation comes from a series of studies conducted in restaurants. So the last time you visit a restaurant, there's a good chance that the waiter or waitress will have given you a gift, probably at about the same time that they bring your bill. A liqueur, perhaps, or a fortune cookie, or perhaps a simple mint. So here's the question. Does the giving of a mint have any influence over how much tip you're going to leave them? Most people will say no, but that mint can make a surprising difference. In the study, giving diners a single mint at the end of their meal typically increased tips by around 3%. Interestingly, if the gift is doubled and two mints are provided, tips don't double. They quadruple, a 14% increase in tips. But perhaps most interestingly of all is the fact that if the waiter provides one mint, starts to walk away from the table, but pauses, turns back, and says, for you nice people, is an extra mint, tips go through the roof. A 23% increase influence not by what was given, but how it was given. So the key to using the principle of reciprocation is to be the first to give, and to ensure that what you give is personalized and unexpected. A nudge. And by the way, I have a bag of mints, so if you'd like some after this, uh, be happy to share. 
So, you know, this takes us into the land of choices. And, you know, we're, we're thinking up great IMC strategies and we've got great plans and we're, we're implementing these plans. And then the question becomes, do we have too many choices? Are we giving our customers too many choices? And I'm one of those people that believes we are. We're in data overload. We're in product overload. And let's take a look at some of these things. You might remember this fine woman from the opening. So this was a study of chocolate. Do you get a few chocolate or a lot of chocolate? And the people that had a selection of 30 chocolates instead of six chocolates were actually less satisfied than the people who could pick from six chocolates. Now, let's go to the store. Now, if my wife says, can you, honey, can you pick up some ketchup on the way home? I'm in deep poo-poo. Do I get the six ounce bottle, the two ounce bottle, the family size, the double pack? Do I get Hunt's? Do I get that brand, that brand, the generic brand? It's like I stand there and say, oh, I need to call her crap because I'm going to do this wrong. It's ketchup, right? But when I go there, to me, as a guy, it looks like this. You know, it's like two levels of ketchup. It looks to me like it's two floors of ketchup. That's all I see is ketchup, ketchup, ketchup. And I know I'm going to get it home and she's going to say, you got the wrong one. So, you know, let's go get some shoes. What do you mean you have 300 to pick from? I just want some shoes. OK, well, I don't have like three hours to pick shoes. And this is what happens. You know, here's the guy who's like pulling his hair out saying, I just want some shoes, you know? I don't care now if they're $300 or $50. Just give me a pair of shoes. So one of the people who has studied this for many years is psychologist and author Barry Schwartz. And Barry's research shows that as the number of choices keeps growing, the number of at negatives also keeps growing. And this begins to bother us as consumers. And as those choices and options keep escalating, eventually it debilitates us. One effect, paradoxically, is that it produces paralysis rather than liberation. With so many options to choose from, people find it very difficult to choose at all. I'll give you one very dramatic example of this, a study that was done of um, investments in uh, voluntary retirement plans. Uh, a colleague of mine got access to um, investment records from Vanguard, the gigantic mutual fund company of about a million employees in about 2,000 different workplaces. And what she found is that for every 10 mutual funds the employer offered, rate of participation went down 2%. You offer 50 funds, 10% fewer employees participate than if you only offer five. Why? Because with 50 funds to choose from, it's so damn hard to decide which funds to choose that you just put it off till tomorrow, and then tomorrow, and then tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, and of course, tomorrow never comes. Understand that not only does this mean that people are going to have to eat dog food when they retire because they don't have enough money put away, it also means that making the decision is so hard that they pass up significant matching money from the employer. By not participating, they are passing up as much as $5,000 a year from the employer who would happily match their contribution. So too many choices can lead us to decision paralysis, unless, of course, you're a child in a toy store, something like that. So one business, there are a number of businesses, but one business has figured this out. What business is that? Who? Trader Joe's, Redbox, keep going. There's one big one. Keep going. Four thousand SKUs, four thousand products compared to the average Walmart that would have hundred and fifty thousand in store. 
Now this is just in store, not online. So what does this mean? If she asks me to get ketchup, you know where I'm going? <laughs> Costco. Because they only have one ketchup. I don't care if it's this big. There's only one ketchup, honey. I got you the ketchup. We have ketchup for the next eight years, but I got you the ketchup. That's what they had at Costco, right? You want mixed nuts? I got you the mixed nuts, sweetheart. That's, they just had one, mixed nuts. It was very easy to pick those. You want wiper blades? You just tell me the size because they only have one brand of wiper blades. You want cherry tomatoes? You got it. One choice. Somebody wants golf clubs? There it is. One brand, one set, take it or leave it. Simple. No paralysis. We're living at a time when it is OK to simplify things for our customers. So let's begin to transition this into online. Another part of the book talks about priming bias. So this has to do with what we see and hear right before we make a decision. So here's an example. When a national survey included this question, right before people were putting information in about a car, and the question is, when will you acquire your next vehicle? Three months, seven to 12, three, six, more than 12 months, it increased purchase rates by 35%. A simple question that popped up was enough of a nudge to move people forward. Let's talk about the words that we use in the naming conventions. You can say 10 out of 100 die or 90 out of 100 are cured. This relates to marketing, what we put online, what we put out in news releases, everything that we say and do. What sounds more positive? What sounds more encouraging? What sounds like people want to engage with? Well, do you want to join our company? 10 out of 100 die. <laughs> no, I don't. Well, 90 out of 100 are cured. I, where do I sign up? Uh, here's an example of a business that figured out if we use the word landfill versus recycle, they drove up the use of recycle, which is exactly what they wanted to do. Because people got it just by changing the word landfill, from trash to landfill, a little nudge. How about this one? Do you want hamburger that's 90% fat free or 10% fat? It's the same burger. It's going to taste the same way. But obviously, you know, it gets, it's kind of a crazy example, but it gets into how we name things. Now, this, is, this goes back to 2008, and this was a crazy one for me. This was a political poll, and here's the question. Who would be the riskier choice for president? Barack Obama, 55%, John McCain, 35 Okay, let's ask it a different way. Who would be the safer choice for president? Uh, John McCain and Barack Obama wouldn't be. But look at the difference in the percentages just by asking the question differently. So it's how we frame words. You know, this could relate to research. How we frame words, naming conventions. Now, how many have read the book Nudge? OK, ladies, you, you please forgive me for what I'm about to do. This is a urinal. This is not a fly in a urinal. It's a pretend fly. And I'll let the author explain the rest. <laughs> by far the most famous example from the book. It turns out some genius 
who, an economist in fact, allegedly at least, an economist who works for the Amsterdam International Airport, Schiphol, got the brilliant idea to etch the image of a housefly in the urinals in the men's bathrooms at the airport. This image of a housefly, it looks extremely realistic. You can uh, see a picture of it uh, on our website, uh, nudges.org. And um, it's located just near the drain. Now, it turns out that men, when they're taking care of their business, they're not fully attending to the task at hand. <laughs> but, and I'm sure there's an evolutionary explanation for this, if you give them a target, they will be. And uh, according to the people who run the airport, spillage has been reduced by 80%. Now, that housefly has become my favorite illustration of a nudge. So what's a nudge? A nudge is some small feature of the environment that attracts our attention and alters our behavior. And it comes down to values. So when should we nudge and when should we shove, uh, I think it's a political judgment. And obviously in some situations we need shoves. We need laws. Fraud is against the law. Murder is against the law. Drunk driving is against the law. We don't need just nudges. On the other hand, sometimes we can combine the two. So for example, uh, in some states, if you've been convicted of uh, DWI, driving while intoxicated, after you serve your sentence and you get your license back, you also have to equip your car with some device that requires you to pass some sobriety test before you turn the car on. Uh, I think that's probably a good rule. So we, we can push the two, but, but how, where we're going to go uh, on, on various uh, public policy issues uh, will be a political decision where, of course, people will, will differ. So I, I don't want to keep talking about the fly, but I did some more research today and actually Somebody turned it into a business and is making hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's called, yeah, it's true. They're now selling the peel on flies. Uh, so there's a business for everything. So nudging is also about giving your consumers sometimes a choice that might be simple and sometimes a default option. But you have to do, be, be, make sure it's right won't alienate your customers, but it can make you millions. Here's an example. A large railroad, Europe. They wanted to make a small change on the website so that reservations would automatically include ticket purchases of one to two euros um, unless uh, the consumer unchecked the box. And uh, this would take care of uh, some elements on the booking form and it would also take care of their seating. 9% of the tickets included the reservation before the change. After the change, this was a little default that automatically added a couple euros. 47% did, but look at the revenue, $40 million. So massive change. So you can use Nudge as a small default setting for a product or service as long as it's a benefit to consumers. And again, we have to do that uh, in a respectful way. Now, earlier, that you know, there was a little hint that nudge can also be used in politics. A lot of research isn't necessarily taking place in campaigns. Campaigns still are not likely to spend a dollar now for something that will yield a lesson in, in December. Um, what they are doing is, is insights that are coming out of academia or coming out of sort of some of these research institutes that have popped up in, in politics are affecting everything that goes on on the ground. And so, you know, when you get uh, contacted the weekend before the election by somebody doing get out the vote for the, for the Obama campaign, they're almost certainly going to ask you, what time do you plan to vote on election day? 
They're not going to write down the answer, but it's because they've learned through years of experiments that asking people what time they plan to vote, where they're going to come from beforehand, what they'll be doing that day, makes them develop a plan, which is a sort of behavioral mechanism that uh, actually makes them more likely to follow through on an action after they've uh, sort of thought through how they're going to do it. So it's not who are you going to vote for. The little nudge is, are you voting and what time do you plan to vote? Does that make sense? Little nudge. So you can ask for a nudge. Now let's talk a little bit about online. So <clears throat> Box. Box did this. They put up 92% of Fortune 500s use Box. It turned out to get great results for them because they demonstrated social proof. Oh, well, if Fortune 500s are using it, I guess I should. Um, I love the name game. And you'll see how we flip it back and forth, too. Well, let's see. You're going online. Do you want to be a starter? Hmm. We really don't want to be starters. Do you want to grow? Well, I've really grown too much, but I don't want to be thought as a grower. Uh, enterprise, you know, I like to connect. So they strategized about which name would be most appealing to people. Does that make sense? They didn't automatically pick four great names. There was one that popped out. And that's the one they wanted people to choose. Now this one, take a look at the pricing. This, this is like flipping the funnel in a different way. It starts with the most expensive, $199. So this has both the name game and it has the pricing. But I like to think more of the pricing. So we start with the most expensive on the left, 49 24 and 12 Well, if we started with 12 most of us would probably pick 24 but if you start with 199, oh, well, 49 seems like such a bargain after 199. And that's exactly what they found. They had gone the traditional model. They had done 12, 24, 49, 199. When they flipped it this way, they drove it up dramatically with the $49 price point. Does color have anything to do with that? A color did, yes. Um, here's one. Let's just put up every social media platform. What we can do is we can say, what are the platforms where our co customers are having conversations primarily? Do we, I, I'm not saying this is an end all be all, but do we have to put up every platform? Limit choice. Consider limiting choice because it might be beneficial to our customers. So what does that mean? It's about decision architecture. Make it easy on the consumer. Don't make it more complicated. Now, many times we've gone to log in and give up some information. So one form, let's take the form on the left here. Put in your name, email address, I want my home address. Jeez, they want the names of my children, my bank account, my Swiss bank account, my overseas bank, you know everything. And most of us opt out. We don't want to do that. But what some businesses have found, if you ask for the name and email address, OK, I'll do that. And then up comes the next screen, asks for just a little bit more information. OK, I'll do that. And up comes the third screen, which is really gathering all the information you want, but it's like a little nudge. So if you ask for it all at once, people are less likely to give it. But if you say, give me a little, a little more, next screen, just a little bit more, research shows that people will do it that way. Does that make sense? So what does all of this mean? For all of us, especially our customers, making decisions can be difficult. The more choices we have and that we give our customers, the more difficult it can be. Consider making it easy for customers. Because otherwise, we'll have scenes like this. 
Now, if you like Adam Levine, or if you're like this fine woman here, who actually has a selfie with Jarrah Cuff on her phone right now that I've seen. It is an opportunity to consider filling out your eval right now. But thank you. I'm very happy to be here, and I'll take any questions that you have. Yes, uh, qu question right. I'm making that up. Any questions? Yes. Now, like, has there been research done? Because we're talking about it's the, it's the second one from the left, because we read left to right. Yes, now, in this have, country. Yes. Now, if in other countries they read right to left, would it be different? If it would it be the second one in from the right? The question is, would it be different in other countries where they don't read left to right? I'm absolutely sure it would be. You know, do I base that on research? No. But, you know, this is based on how in this country we, we read left to right? Great question. Yes? When it's a longer decision process, say I work at a university, so for us recruiting these undergraduate students could be a three-year process if they come to us their sophomore year, or it could be, you know, they decide in March, oh, wait, I'm going to go to college, and they have, like, you know, eight weeks. Um, how does that just work the way it's such a long process? Do you have to break it down to the baby? or any suggestions of when you're doing it over, say, three years? The question is, how do you handle nudges and a decision-making process over a longer period of time, such as three years? I, I think what we've learned from the research is anything that continues slight engagement, but not necessarily trying to put the pressure on to completely close the deal. Does that make sense? Keep it simple keep little nudges to keep engagement. But some people will back away from either the complexity of choices or the pressure to do it now. Does that help answer it? Other questions? No snoring happened, which is very good. Yes? The question is, have, has there been research about how many choices are ideal? The answer is yes. The answer is it would have been perfect if I had that answer for you. Um, I'm a believer that unless you have a retail site where you're actually selling products, many products, I'm a believer that you really try to show three choices. You know, I think we saw some examples here where three makes it very easy. Certainly at least three a page without having to flip through multiple pages. I think it gets down to for whatever it is that you're marketing or selling, what is most simple for your customer? You know, could it be four? Yes. But I think ideally three is a very magic number for all of us. You know, two is like either or. Three gives us some degree of choice. Yes? So, uh, playing off of that question, I work for a nonprofit. We do donations. We have a lot of options on our pledge card. $35,000, $50,000, $10,000. Is other a viable or a good option or a better option for <laughs> the This is a great question. Um, the question is for a nonprofit that has on a donor, uh, donation card uh, options from 35,000 all the way to other. Um, there's been a great deal of research about this. And uh, having worked for uh, two nonprofits and been on a couple of boards, I know just enough to be dangerous. But you know, I think what taking some of this research and some of my experience, I think what I've learned is you want to start with a reasonable stretch on the far left. You don't want to start with the lowest prices on the far left. So you want to take that example where we had the $199. Because if you start with 25 on the left, people will opt for 25. If you start, 
and you want to figure out what's the sweet spot where this group of donors can likely land because wherever you start and wherever you end has to be realistic. So if you're with a, a group of donors at a luncheon where their capacity is 250 to 500, putting 35,000 wouldn't make sense. But if you put, you know, 150 to 1,000 with the sweet spot in the middle, then it would make sense. Does that make sense? I, are, are there times and are there products where you don't want to limit choice? The answer is yes. But, you know, I think you have to take into account what's happening with our current buying program, what's happening with, you know, are they opting out before purchase, are we making it too complicated versus do we have consumers and buyers who that's not an issue for? They'll deal with many products and many issues, and, and you know, the opt out rate on the cart is 10 or 15 or 20 percent. But if you have, you know, that, that cart issue where they stop, you know, the question is finding out at what point are they stopping, and then looking at what's the content, you know, what's driving them away. Is it price? Is it uh, complexity? Is it photos? quality of product, what is it? Um, you know, again, I think we live in a time when we all want choice, but we're also living in a time when we also have to take a look at, are we also giving our consumers too much complexity? So I think that's the takeaway. Any other questions? I did put this on SlideShare. I learned this morning that was a very smart thing to do. So it's, uh, if you can't read it, it's uh, Joe Barnes slash nudge. Um, I would not be able to read this from the back. It's 35, 33, 41, 87. I kept trying to get like a simple thing like nudge Joe Barnes and it kept popping up numbers. So I apologize for that. Any other questions? Make a difference? Yeah, make a difference. Would, would the number, gender make a difference? Make a difference in the number of choices offered. Like it almost seems like Costco is designed for men. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly makes it easy on me. Um, the answer is yes, but we are still living in a, in a time pressured world. So, you know, I'm talking, in this we're talking about both in store and online. So I think you, again, have to take a look at it. What is it that you're marketing? How much time do our, really knowing your consumers, how much time do they have, whether they're male or female, are they coming in to browse and buy, or are they coming in to buy quickly? Do they, you know, how much time do they spend on pages? And getting that sort of information, because that can help you determine and then you can also look at, you know, where are they coming from and are they coming in direct and, and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, it's like in my house, you know, my wife, my wife is the Costco shopper. She goes in and out and I'm like, honey, I want to go to the mall today for eight hours. You know, it's like, what? I want to go shopping. Um, any other questions? Thank you very much. I really appreciate all of you being here. <laughs>